Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I just want to do a late night stream and talk about some stuff um, that I was thinking about today. And um, it's Good Friday, you know, so uh, I don't know. People are off. People are free tomorrow. And uh, why not go live late? So thanks for joining me. Um, I just want to check in on the chat, see everything's good with you. Um, I want to talk about organized Organized begging in modern Ireland is my title I'm putting on this um, because uh, I can't use open terminology on YouTube or I would be banned or, you know, I don't know, um, sensitive terms of service. So I have to be uh, delicate. Now, uh, yeah, I just want to check the chat and say hello to you all as well. Um, I see someone says they're a new subscriber, Stephen West. Welcome. Welcome aboard um yeah you know i love i love doing this i was thinking about it recent or like even just kind of this evening about why i enjoy doing these and uh tonight look you know maybe people will have a rewatch off this tomorrow i don't think there are going to be many people awake at this time but uh yeah it's great to do these because i find that even for the few years where i wasn't streaming i found that uh, i i was losing the ability to speak to some of these issues basically getting less sort of um uh quick like um the the mind to mouth connection the the ability to kind of speak extemporaneously and all that i had um it had kind of gotten a bit rusty and i was i was thinking it was old age or something that i was getting a bit slower but uh i think i've realized from getting back to it now and i'm still a rambler and i can lose my train of thought but uh I realize now that it's just a muscle memory thing actually which is so one of the great benefits of doing this for me as well is that um is that it's um it's just like uh, the gym or something for for speaking and what i was thinking about i'm already rambling i'll get onto the topic in a second but what i was thinking about kind of just before i went live uh when i was just around the house doing a few things there is that um the connection between uh, language and I see a lot of this in my like my toddler for example he's learning to speak and so I'm interested in this stuff but and um, the connection between from an adult's point of view will say the connection between writing um speaking and thinking how uh, basically you don't think in a vacuum or, or well you do obviously within your own brain but speaking with people let's say out loud affects how you think and the the sort of um the rate at which you can think and how clearly you can get through ideas and stuff like that. So it actually ends up having an effect on how you think, uh, in my view. Also, um, writing is another one because it's distinct from this. what I'm doing now. Writing is totally different. I realized this the other night. I did a stream on China. I'm not going to go over that again, but it's an essay I wrote on this whole chain thing about China. It doesn't really matter, but I am... Um, I wanted to stream on it and I opened up the article to to kind of go through it. And I didn't know how I was going to approach it. And I ended up kind of reading through the article and trying to say something on stream and realizing that I couldn't possibly outperform what I had written because I had crystallized my thoughts perfectly as far as I could do in the article. And so speaking to it was kind of redundant because I, every time I tried to say something novel on the next point, I realized that I couldn't actually say it better. I ended up just reading my own essay off for a stream. It was kind of half ridiculous. but. Uh, but it's just you know it, it it um especially on dissident ideas these streams are and maybe it helps this is why it helps if you're not publicly out there to listen as well listening obviously does something for the brain too you learn and you kind of feel like you're conversing yourself a little bit but um yeah i just i find that interesting that phenomenon as someone who's kind of doing this that um it affects how you think um on these issues but uh and uh, and and the medium are, the media are different writing or speaking anyway so that's why i like doing these and uh, i don't mind going late if, you know um it's not good for like if you're trying to clout or view chase or any of that um necessarily but you know if i don't come on live to talk about whatever i'm going to speak to you about tonight i'm, I'm just not going to do it so um anyway that's that's just my point of view on streaming that's why I'm going live at 20 past 11 when half of you are asleep. Um, I want to talk about the this organized begging in Ireland. Uh, I was kind of tweeting about it today 
and um, it got it was you know um, quite I wouldn't say it caused a stir, but it got more attention. You know, I just gave this kind of half effort post, like lengthy, you know, from a distance you could say turgid kind of tweet about a thought I had uh, about these organized beggars, and uh, yeah, it kind of caught on a little bit. A lot of people were you know interested and in commenting on it. Um, so I want to basically give a, a spiel on it now, and I want to read some of the comments I got back on Twitter as well about these organized beggars. Now, just so you're clear, I have a thumbnail for this video of um, people I'm not necessarily accusing of being organized beggars. I don't know what they are necessarily for legal reasons and all that, but let's just say. You get the idea of what I'm talking about with an organized beggar. So from here on in, I suppose I will use the term organized begging or organized beggar for the type of people I'm, or the type of character I'm referring to here. Um, I'll start by sharing a video with you. So I know I'm, my eyes are all over the place here, guys, but uh, I want to share a video with you. Make it kind of bigger. Um, just to kind of get the ball rolling, because there's a guy in Dublin who has been... I don't know who he is. Someone messaged me earlier today asking me, some guy, random guy messaged me asking me for uh, or asking me for the the source of the videos. I actually don't know. I, I saw the various people posting it on Telegram. One or two people, one or two of those people said that they had seen it on Instagram reels or whatever it is ages ago. They can't remember what it is. It's just some guy. He might be on Instagram. It, it kind of doesn't matter in a sense. Um, just as regards the source. He basically goes around Dublin, whoever this guy is, I don't know. He goes around Dublin city centre and just does a very sort of rebellious thing in modern Ireland, which is um, he just sort of confronts them. He's polite, he's 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 direct, and um, he seems like he's confident. He must be confident kind of guy walking up to these. But a lot of people would be too afraid. So he's he's bold and kind of brash in a sense, but he's actually actually very polite. He's not aggressive at all, really. He's you can hear he's got a very gentle sort of reasonable, and that's what's interesting. He just goes up and is being reasonable, and yet that's a, a, like a revolutionary act these days. So I'll just play some video, and I'll check in on the chat. People to be on the street begging when you get housed and you get fed by the Irish yeah, government at the expense of the yeah, Irish taxpayer. There's real homeless people yeah, out there. No, really, there's real homeless people out there that are scraping money for a bed. You have a bed, you're being fed at the expense of the Irish tax cut. You know, we don't keep, we know you're, you're being a you're part of an organized begging group, we know that. Do you think it's acceptable to be out here begging on the street when you get housed by the Irish government? And there's real homeless people out there that are trying to get money up for a bed. Have you any answer to that? No English. No English? I'm sure you have English when you're asking for the money. Yeah. You have home, you have you get you get welfare from the state, you know? I know you're part of the begging wing. It's day in, day out. You, you switch from here to up there and then you go down there. Okay, I'm just gonna scrub through it because I'm not just gonna it. play video at you here. No, for the we don't want it, but just, come uh, on. I just wanna give you the idea. You see what he does, right? I guess people uh, just kinda asks people he's entitled to um record in public. Yeah, so you get the idea. The best one, not the best one, but like the most, you know, glaring one, I think, is towards the end here with the, the car. He gets him kind of dead to rights. Hello. Hi, how's it going? Can I ask you guys a question, yeah? This is a good, nice BMW, yeah? Why is it that you guys are in town begging and then you drop off all the stuff into the BMW? Yeah, you. Can I ask you a question? I go. You're going, yeah? Why is the problem? Because yeah. you guys beg. Every time I see these guys, they get yeah, into trouble. Yeah, you're my friend, you. I have been no, talking to you. Yeah, not my problem. It's not your problem? No. No? No. You think it's fair that the Irish people don't get housed and you guys do? And you drive around in nice cars and yeah, it's my, it's my job, not new problem. You have a job, yeah? Me job. What, what job you have? Me? Yeah. Me job. What job? Green. Dynamics and dynamics. The food finishment. Hey, no, no problem. No problem, yeah. Yeah, you stick your finger up. No problem. No 
So yeah, uh, yeah, that's that. But it's um, I, I want to read you an article as well while I'm at it. It's um, this is recently it's from Ripped, and I saw Late Stage Ireland posting about this. I don't know that they rip it from him or did he get it from them or whatever. It doesn't really matter. So this is Gripped. Um, professional beggars, quote unquote, in receipt of three thousand euro per month in state payouts operating in Mayo, says councillor. An independent. Uh, I'll just kind of go through it. Very quickly, you get the idea. Um, an independent councillor for Westport has said that professional beggars, some of whom are in receipt of thousands of euro, are, are begging. Um, he's basically saying, "Oh, the town is going to be taken over. If we we have to nip, nip it in the bud now, it's going to be a few, and then it'll be dozens." Um, I've looked into it, and a lot of these people are getting lots of money from the state anyway. They're well looked after. They have houses, welfare, the whole lot. And they're like begging, making like hundreds of euro every day, and it's going to ruin the town. I hope I've been saying organized beggar and not. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it to the proper vocabulary here. Um, so yeah, that's that. And it um, basically my idea, not idea today, um, but sort of, let me switch over here. I'll just keep the screen share tab open. So, uh, cause I'm kind of going through stuff. It's sort of, you know, we've like, I'm not telling you anything new with like this this has been going on for decades really like in all of the stuff in modern ireland that's happening this is actually one of those things that is not the newest like plantation centers are on a mass scale these days like the the amount we're seeing now is sort of a, in the last 10 years it existed a bit before that but it wasn't really noticeable to anybody um until like the last 10 years maybe since 2016 or something like that it, it started to ramp up and uh, other stuff too, phenomena like um, this Dublin city centre being totally replaced and stuff like that is, um, I suppose, is a bit new. But I'm 30, I'm going to be 33 soon enough, actually. And um, even when I was a young kid in Cork, and Cork was really, really Irish, you know, um, back then, like you'd rarely see, you'd rarely see anyone who wasn't Corkonian, really back then um and that's the thing i've remarked on many times a lot of irish people my age or older will remark on that how uh, until relatively recently the cities were very irish obviously um but um even then the the certain amount of foreigners that you had like there were a few here and there you know of all classes and types there there's a handful rare enough to see but one of those classes were organized beggars I do remember that in Cork, and it, it was a much, to a much, much lesser extent, but they were there for those who are from Cork and of my vintage. The bridge going from Cork City Library over to down to the south side, whatever that bridge is called, the ugly one. There was always one there, cup out and uh, putting on the sad face and stuff. And uh, someone says, sorry, someone says, 33, Jesus, you're the um same age as my oldest daughter yeah i know yeah but um it's all relative i suppose but um you know who's old and who's young but um yeah i used to see that that uh back in cork city and it's one it's one of those things that just uh, if i can give my own comment on it one of the reasons i i have a problem with this organized begging is is not so much that like they take money and it's organized crime and uh they're abusing state generosity and stuff like that that's obviously egregious and it's not fair, etc. But what gets me the most is the cynical abuse of generous people and a generous society. Um, and and what gets me even more than that is specifically not just the abuse of it, but the fact that by abusing it, you destroy it effectively. So in order for you to get a few hundred euro or for your pimp or whatever you call it like a begging pimp in order you know your people in order for you to make you know a probably like a like an average salary if and you've probably drug dealing on top of that but in order for you to make a chunk of change nothing major in the grand scheme of things but in order for you to like grift out this income for yourself you're sort of going a long way to destroying the entire social fabric of a country um, which is quite a serious thing, you know, Ireland being the troke or a box and the, you know, look after the fella down the road and bring him down a bottle of milk and all this kind of stuff. That whole fabric 
it's sort of like to me it's kind of like a spider and you could probably find studies on this too it's kind of like a spider's web or something like that where if you kind of damage it you could kind of destroy the integrity of the whole thing um and i do think it sort of works that way your your kindness and the kindness of a society and a people and a culture sort of cannot withstand it being breached so it's kind of like the you know father ted was a good satire of like old ireland and father ted's funny because it you know it 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 satirizes some of the more ridiculous and silly elements of ireland like traditional ireland but sometimes there's a bit of love in it too you know we, we all watch father ted and we don't sort of when we have a laugh off it we're not scathing of it we we love it it's kind of ours and obviously it's a caricature anyway but in Father Ted, there's the whistle, you know, where the whistle goes missing and everyone freaks out because someone stole a whistle. And it's sort of the idea of like a small town mindset and taking this small thing seriously. But there's something in that as well. The idea that like, you know, we're not used to murders. We're not used to this. We're not used to that. We're not used to people breaching, you know, this kind of stuff. The idea that money goes missing from a collection tray in the church or money goes missing from here or there or whatever. It's just so rare that when it happens it it is a sort of a scandal because and the reason it's a scandal is because everyone recognizes that well if if we go down this road and if we don't find the culprit of this and if we don't totally get this um then we have a big problem because again the whole underpinning of the trust and reciprocity is sort of pulled out um and that would be in just minor instances here and there would be a threat to that sort of order and and by the way, it's not any kind of jackbooted, overly strict order. It's just a basic, it's actually very loose. It's a much more loose and relaxed form of civilization, which is that you don't need to worry about watching everything and being careful and distrusting everybody. You can just think, well, you know, I can kind of put my wallet down here. If I drop my wallet, there's a good chance I can come back the next day and it's going to, someone's going to pick it up and left it somewhere for me, that kind of thing. Um, and there's nobody around my back trying to pull something out of my pocket. I don't have to worry about that because. I'm a good person. I wouldn't rob anybody. Uh, I wouldn't cross my mind. Uh, I would do the opposite. I would try to help somebody or give them their wallet back if I found it or whatever. And uh, I'd like to think I can expect that back. And now we can all relax and mellow out and be chill and uh, have a um, a more sort of open heart and more open, um, um, just a better social fabric, right? Uh, it, you know, I'm explaining the obvious, but they they sort of uh, pull that apart and they don't care that's to me that's worse like if they were just getting if they had pulled some scam where like i don't know behind the scenes they could scam millions for themselves but nobody knew about it or something i'd be like morally that's wrong but if no it's almost like if a tree falls in the woods if nobody somehow knew about it then that would be okay you know it's just a bit of crime or corruption you know in a sense um it's the fact that it's in people's faces and it's reminding people every day of how um how sort of broken the 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 trust circle is basically the other thing too referring back to cork when i like when i was a kid and i would see these people i'm talking like when i'm like six seven eight years old you know and i'm going through town and of course they're doing the um they're doing the the sad face and all that kind of stuff and in hindsight they do that whatever you know the sad the, the face right in hindsight when they would they would do that to, uh, uh, now to me let's say to some extent they probably measure it per target they see how like maybe oh you know of a mark you are but when i look back as a kid i can remember the fact that they would actually look at me quite a lot and give me the sad face and as an adult now i understand that they were targeting my innocence as a child because i knew that all i knew was that like i didn't really know much about it because i'm a kid but i know that they're supposedly homeless um ad, 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 in bad fortune it's cold hungry whatever it is i'm that's what i'm gleaning from the situation and they're giving me the sad face and i think oh that's sad because we have a house you know and uh that poor person children are beautifully innocent and uh the fact that this one of these scumbags was looking at me a kid in my own country and putting that psychological burden onto me to try and get maybe me to ask my mother to put a pound into the cup or whatever um is is beyond egregious to do that right um and that's obviously what they're doing now 
you know, um, that I, I mean, I would consider that a form of child abuse. Um, so, you know, it you start to wonder what what the point is of it at a mass scale, like why that is allowed, why you can't just get rid of that, um, why the adults allow it. Um, and, you know, you come to some pretty obvious conclusions. What I was thinking about anyway was that it's not it's not sort of accidental. You know, like if you and your pals decided to get together and form a some sort of group where you're going to go around effectively scamming and begging and getting into cars afterwards and all this, like the reality is probably you as a normal Irish person, ordinary decent person, I'd say it would be pretty quick before you'd have the guards onto you and shopkeepers out to you and people would be getting rid of you pretty quickly. It's almost like this whole racket has a protection around it. And I'm not, I don't have any like breaking news on like uh, smoking guns of the state um, protecting this in, in a formal sense, but it's quite obvious just by its very existence that that's the case. Um, they're like, you know, and, and it's the extent as well, just by the way, to, to, to distinguish between my experience as a kid seeing this that was the odd one now it's i was i was on patrick street there a couple of weeks ago in cork and uh it's like all up and down the street like i from one end to the end from one end to the other it's not that long there i must have seen and like i'm talking with the cop out and all that probably 20 and it's not what is it half of an o'connell street or something a lot anyway and then o'connell street speaking of which a different story again where it's you know, you're talking um, talking dozens, hundreds, maybe milling around the place, absolutely taking over the centre of O'Connell Street. Um, and then you go into smaller towns around Ireland too, you're going to have three or four. There's one guy in a town near me, uh, rocks back and forth all day with the cup out and uh, then wanders off, probably goes home to his house. That is state-funded, um, I'm assuming. Um, fully state funded house, social house. I'm assuming if his um if he gets a little leak in his roof, he can probably contact the council and get a man over to uh, fix it for him. The whole rigmarole. But um, yeah. But anyway, look, I could this uh, me kind of rambling on about the egregiousness of it at a street level is obvious. Like I could have been talking about this 15 years ago. Everyone kind of gets it to some extent. But um, my point is is that it's sort of like a there's sort of like a symbiosis, in my view, perhaps, with a ruling elite. And Ireland is a very good example of it. It's the same all over Europe, but I'll focus on what I know, which is that you have a country that's run by shadow banking. Everyone has their own theory, but like run by shadow banking, vulture funds, international finance, largely Wall Street, probably, or definitely. Um there's a, an account on Twitter called Archiving Irish Diversity that does great stuff on, and I'm going to put some of it together soon, on um, the Vulture Fund buyout of Ireland, specifically after 2010. But it, like it, that theory obviously explains the, the property situation and everything, the immigration situation. I think it's all downstream from this kind of, um, basically, for the most part, the people who marched in after 2008 and like, what what of Ireland wasn't bought up before that? There was a whole chunk bought up after, um, for a song, um, and they basically sank their teeth in, and um, it turned Ireland into a like a colony, a complete colony, like no remaining sovereignty whatsoever, just a thing to shake down for profit from like renters and stuff like that and put their multinationals in and all of that. So we have a society kind of run by that. And then at the lower levels, all of the Gombeans get their cut along the way. And that sort of is the only paradigm, to use that word, at play in Ireland. I, I spoke about China recently, but you could say the same for, um, you could say the same for African countries, you, which is that they have corruption, they have a tar like the uglier form of authoritarianism, just the same as every country does. They have their aspects that are bad, and a, a large part of their ruling elite and gov governments are there to make money for themselves and their inner circle and all that. That's definitely, I'm not like a utopianist 
who believes that other places are perfect or whatever they have those elements just like we do the the difference with those countries taking china as a prime example is that they also have a large block within their ruling elite who care effectively about the country in some fashion whether it's through their own pride or just a sense of national um, solidarity with their people whatever it is there's a large chunk of people and maybe even some people some individuals are split down the middle they're sort of corrupt but they sort of care about what goes on in the country so that's what i mean there's a dichotomy to it there's a split whereas in ireland and a lot of western europe america australia the west it's completely wheels off you there there is no element within the power structure or ruling regime or in political elite who have any semblance of interest in how the country goes and their only role is to administrate over this territory and jurisdiction that exists to just make money for certain people um, and put certain people in power. I would say Wall Street's the biggest contender there, basically. It's just there for that American regime, Wall Street type of thing, colonial regime. It's got its own mindset to it. To um, It's for them to make money and have control, and everything else is just downstream from that. But um, in, a, in such a society, these organized beggars sort of form an obvious role at the street level where if you can't say, if you can't walk up and down your street and sort of turn to the guy next to you and go, uh, what the fuck is going on here? Like, why are there 40 people here with cups who are clearly getting into BMWs and they clearly hate us and have no regard for us? And are involved in crime and you know all of this stuff right you know if you can't sort of um and i'll get to some of the quotes on my because i want to read through it here there were some good replies because i tweeted basically what i'm saying now out earlier and uh someone for example here someone quoted a british he's a british kind of academic i don't know what he does now but his name is T or his um the name he uses is theodore dalrymple and there's this quote that goes around online a lot it's kind of like one of these Yuri Bezmenov type of things that just uh, people like to kind of, people like to quote. I had it in front of me and I lost it. Um, he says, it's just a quote from him. He says, in my study of communist societies, I came to the conclusion that the purpose of communist, and by the way, he said, I don't agree it's all communism, but this is the word he's using in here. In my study of communist societies, I came to the conclusion that the purpose of communist propaganda was not to persuade or convince nor to inform but to humiliate and therefore the less it corresponded to reality the better when people are forced to remain silent they when they are being told the most obvious lies or even worse when they are forced to repeat lies themselves they lose once and for all their sense of probity to assent to obvious lies is to cooperate cooperate with evil and in some small way to become evil oneself one standing to resist anything is thus eroded and even destroyed a sense of emasculated liars is easy easy to control so it's kind of that like um two plus two equals three or two, five or whatever it is, the George Orwell 1984 thing. Um, it's that kind of idea. The idea that like if if you can kind of um, push on people and force them to assent to obvious nonsense and to, to sort of bow their head and look away when they see obvious corruption, obvious wrongdoing, st something that shouldn't be happening, then you sort of um, gain a certain amount of control over those people that is useful in a political sense. Kind of like, um, I'm thinking of like E. Michael Jones's whole theory of um, sexual liberation as political control. It's kind of like these organized beggars on the street is a form of daily political control. Um, and, you know, it doesn't, it's sort of like, I could see someone questioning that, like how, like, is that a bit of an overdone conspiracy theory where you're, you're sort of implying more than is is apparent but it's it's kind of not like in the absence of an explanation i think mine kind of fits other people quoted solzhenitsyn that like apparently he said in the gulag archipelago i haven't read it in the gulag archipelago that um the soviet regime would effectively empower local sort of low-level street criminals in order to um demoralize the population um which again, some people would find these kind of things hard to believe if they if they're a bit if they buy in like they might think it sounds outlandish. Like, why would people want that? But um, my theory was that someone like Banti, for example, right? And I'll just give you 
an example here. I'll read, I've read this before now, but it's, uh, I think it was on a stream with Semi Agog. I kind of maybe went through a bit of this. So Banti, Seamus McEnany, he's a former GA manager, GA manager. Um, there's this expose came out on him not too long ago, and it was um, he. He's basically the headline is Banti and fourteen family members paid over 130 million to house so-called refugees. And uh, you go through this article, and it's it's this is just an example of the corruption I'm talking about. At, and this isn't even at the top. He's a mid level, really, right? Um, but just look at you're talking 130 million. Um, so it shows how much he's paid directly, but then it sort of goes through all these, and I don't know this kind of business stuff or LLCs or whatever it is, these kind of shell, what I assume, what it appears to me as sort of shell companies for um, families. So it's like his aunt, his niece, his nephew, his dog, his dog's aunt, they all, each of them have a, uh, some little company that's making 5 million from housing asylum seekers and all this kind of stuff. So obviously it's all just the one entity probably. And uh, just that's corruption in my view, that's off the scale. Um, and just as a side note as well, you often see that um, you often see that like Ireland ranks low in corruption and highest in happiness and highest in, you know, Delira all of, you know, of the whole world. These kind of are, we have the greatest economy in the world, the best GDP, the lowest, lowest this the highest happiness whatever all this kind of and one of the big ones is lowest like low on corruption i think you see that quite a bit and it's kind of ridiculous because it's it obviously depends on your definition like something like this for example when the corruption monitors are coming to ireland to do their review or whatever from the un or whatever it is i mean they don't look at someone like banty and file that down as like a mark on the corruption index because according to the law in ireland allegedly or apparently According to the law, and th this is all perfectly legal, there is no corruption here, technically speaking, apparently. Whereas in reality, any normal person, and it, given that the majority are against this and there's been no vote on this ever had, and it's the exchange of money for effectively what I consider human trafficking, the housing, the trafficking of human beings for profit, migrants especially, um, that's just deemed not corruption. Um, but like I say, that's true for Banti with his 130 million, but of course he's a small fish compared to um, the the shadow banking, which is stuff we don't even really know about. I mean, there's there are sources on this stuff, but you know, tax havens. With, we're effectively a tax haven with hundreds of billions flying through and under all these guises that nobody really has a full track on, and then you put in the you know what is it Nama sold off like 73 billion in assets for nothing to these shadowy um uh american hedge funds for the most part and then these developers were brought back in who had failed on all these loans um and sort of brought back into administer it like just corrupt top to bottom and now the the asylum seeker thing is part of the scam and raising the population to inflate the the proceeds or whatever just one big massive scam you think about that and you think if I were one of them, if I were Banty or if I were some politician in Ireland, I I would sleep a lot better at night knowing that this happens on the street, that there are hundreds, dozens and hundreds, depending on a town or city in Ireland, in people's faces and ordinary decent people who go to work and who pay their bills and who wouldn't steal a matchstick if they found it on the street, that nothing. Um, have to walk by this stuff and see it and they know full well they know listen these organized beggars are going back to a nice cozy house on their expense and you have to walk past them and sort of say nothing um and apparently and the political control is so tight that you know unless you're with a bunch of lads and you're playing poker you're really chill or whatever if you're in any kind of thing where it's like where it's not really a bunch of like proper lads or if you're in a, like any kind of polite society setting whether it's work or just a you know a sort of semi you know conversation with somebody you don't know that well or or whatever in, in sort of polite society you know you're not supposed to mention that you couldn't like you could say to someone oh the weather is good the weather's bad this and that's going on oh the traffic is very bad in town and oh there's a i heard there was a flood or whatever it is but you couldn't just say what's the story with those guys outside the shop right they're clearly 
you know, you see what I see. They would be like, oh yeah, I don't know. Like people would they know they know what time it is. They know, oh well, be careful talking about this. And it's like, why do you have to be careful talking about this? I mean, it's there's no it's uncontroversially a fact that this is one big absolutely egregious scam. And somehow people supposedly can't talk about it. Um, if you were to just tell these go up to these people and just tell them to fuck off, apparently that's bad, that might get you in trouble. So people go around, they bow their heads, they avert their eyes, and they shut their mouths. Um, and it's sort of like it, you know, if you think of like a village in its most classical form, where like people are kind of free or a free society, in the 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 moment the first person like that appears who has speaks no English is completely hostile, a complete scammer, all of this, the first thing that would be done is someone would just go up and say, out of here, right? Go, go away. Whoever you are, go and keep going. And the police would be involved. They're like They would be siding with that. They would. The police would probably be the ones to do it. But everyone would just say, yeah, out. Um, there, there'd be no controversy on that. You would have a complete unanimity within the community to be like, yeah, this is, this is wrong. It has to stop. So, and what, that society would be a society, that hypothetical village or country, would be a type of society where people feel like they, without even thinking about it, feel like they have a stake in it, that they are allowed to say, and this goes ties back to the asylum seeker thing where every town is protesting and they get shoved out of the way by police and just ignored and ignored. It's the same phenomena where it's like, it's basically the state is telling you, you don't have any say, like, like we can, it's kind of like a shit test to use PUA language. You know, we can do anything. We can we can allow anything, which is effectively a form of consent to allow something bad to happen. The anarcho tyranny theory is to condone it and sanction it in effect. Um, so we're we're allowing this, and you're not saying anything. And like I say, if if I were a banty or if I were a shadow banking person or a politician who's paid by that industry. If the people got it into their heads that they could go, and I'm not talking about violence or anything, but if they got the idea that they could go around their towns and lobby their guardy, lobby their local um, political and administrative representatives and say, listen, I want those gone from the town. I don't care about NGOs. I don't care about any weird regime that's above us hovering over there. They should be gone. They shouldn't be here. We want to live in a nice, normal society. And to take me in Cork as an example, when I was a kid, I want to bring, and it's for me now with my own kids, I feel the same way. I want to take my child to the shop. And I don't feel like someone who is gets a full state income and a free house, who obviously doesn't need to beg. Not that that's even relevant, but they, that, that makes it especially bad. They don't need to beg and they are begging and they're, they're taking the piss and they're giving the sad face to my kid. And I don't want that. I, I, I pay taxes I, I abide by the law. I do my end of the bargain. Why do I have to deal with this person? Why do I have to look at this person? Um, that would be a normal, healthy society where you would basically, the majority of people would go to their leaders in the local area and say, say that and I have that enacted. Oh yeah, these people just need to go and keep going. Um, not going to be allowed. Either they get the welfare pulled or they get kicked out, whatever it is. Um that would be a society whereby the likes of a banty and the likes of a shadow bank would have to start getting slightly uneasy where they would have to think, well, these proles, these sort of underling people, these natives are getting ideas. They're starting to get it into their head that they have some say over what happens. And if they start thinking like that, if they start saying this thing is obviously wrong and shouldn't happen and i don't want it to we all don't want it to. it's not an individual thing there's a there's a consensus here that we don't want that and that's and it's there's no argument on whether it's right or wrong it's clearly wrong and we all want it gone so put two and two together if if that caught, catches on of course then a society might expect more they might say well why does a working family um have to pay two thousand euro a month for a crappy house that's about 90 years old um, and is falling apart and like a landlord who doesn't care and they're trying to raise kids, all the rest of it, right? Why do why do I have to pay 2,000 euro for that? That's not really worth 2,000 euro, is it? I mean, it's just a, some concrete and and some, a roof and a little bit of space. Why why do I have to be um, 
um, milked on that basis for just something as simple as having a roof over my head. I go out to work really hard and now I have to give the majority of my income for something that should just be reasonable, right? Um, why is that? Why why are there 100, 200,000 people coming in when we have this situation? Who owns these properties? What's going on? Like, what is going on? Can we sit down and have all the adults and the normal people have a conversation and and figure it out and say, just like I don't want these organized beggars on my street and taking the piss, I also, I'm more interested in the higher ups who are taking the piss now. So you see my point of how you end up with that sort of connection there to think, yeah, it, it maybe it's not so much a coincidence that you're living in this um, extraction society where ordinary people are being basically, yeah, milked for their lifeblood. Um, maybe that society likes to have that level of that that sort of atmosphere on the street where that's what you're subjected to and you really can't say anything about it and you are powerless about it. The reason the video I showed you at the start is sort of compelling is because you really never see a person do that. Um, you're meant to just look away and bow your head and just kind of walk away feeling bad, feeling weak, feeling totally powerless. Um, so I don't know, I, I, what else did I say about this? I'm just reading my own thing from earlier, but um, uh, yeah, that it's like a litmus test for how marginalized people feel from having any say whatsoever. But um, yeah, it's like you would start with, like you could potentially start with wanting your street to be normal. And next thing you're wondering about these deals that are being whispered about on golf courses, again, between hedge funds and local politicians and the rest of it. And you would just put an end to it. So that's um, that's kind of my, well, not my full thoughts on that. I actually, so to go over to kind of back it up in a way, there was a story here from, this is sort of like circumstantial evidence as well. I'm not making a court case here on it. I think anybody watching, I don't need to exactly convince anyone. It's kind of obvious. Um, actually, no, sorry. There's one thing I want to go back to quickly because it's a commenter here and I'll find him. He made a great set of points. He made a very good set of points. I could find him. Um, should kind of have these ready. He was talking about how workplaces will break someone in in order to be able to exploit them and the psychology of sort of um the psychology of a workplace the relationship between managers the underling staff and kind of owners and it was very good i'll just go into my likes because i i did like it a while ago um yeah i have it here so his um his at is boku novico um where yeah just want to find the entire kind of thread. So he basically said that it's similar to how employees are broken in, just scaled up to a global level. And I said, come here, expand on that for me. It's in, that sounds interesting. And I'll just read what he said back to me. Um, he said, in the process, in the process, an employee basically drops their aversion to working. Or sorry, no. He says, basically, in certain jobs, employees are often overburdened or hazed when they join. When they join, so they, sorry, when they join, so they get comfortable with working a certain way, i.e. answering calls outside of work hours and working late. It's done so they don't push back when they need to do it later. Um, in the process of an employee, in the process, an employee, I can't read, lads, Jesus, it's late. In the process, an employee basically drops their aversion to working more slash harder. I think the diversity works in a similar way, forces people to drop certain civil expectations early on in the globalization pro pro process um and this is where i it spoke to me most i was like yeah that's an interesting point for some jobs this explains why certain kinds of horrible people are useful to the firm they're good at quote quote unquote breaking in new employees and producing hard workers similar for criminals and globalization and his theory goes on a bit but that idea that like in a lot of companies you'll have certain managers who you know you get in there and you kind of go you go that person is a horrible bastard basically um and they're 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 sort of um they're there to do that job to break people in and get people used to the the, the bad conditions effectively and sort of any time let's say the underlings in the work place if you've ever noticed this sort of get together and go our hours are crap our pay, you know the pay is just not risen with inflation and you know we used to get this break and it was okay but now we're getting 15 minutes less and, and they keep moving around the um especially in the precarious work environment these days they keep moving around their shifts and 
you, you'll often see like workers going kind of uh, these days, especially saying like, it would almost be easier if the workplace just, if like, if we came up with a reasonable solution for hours and stuff that was steady and appropriate, that workplace, the owners, like the the big company or whatever it is, they would get what they want. What they want is a little bit of flexibility. They want this, they want that. We've got a plan that would actually serve that exactly to them, perhaps even better than what's happening now for that stated objective. Um, and yet the middle manager will always kind of shoot it down and say, no, I, I, you know, he'll kind of fob it off. And, uh, it, it, you know, people are left wondering what's going on. Like, why, why is there no say? Why are we so weakened? um by this kind of system and it's you know in the same way i think it's often because they they don't want the employees the like the lowest level or the 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 sort of mass employees at the bottom they don't want them even though it might be true that it actually would be easier and better for everyone and it would give people better personal lives to be able to have more reliable hours or whatever it is holidays the company it's not that they don't recognize that that might be the case but that well, if we start granting employees, like if we start granting that to them to say, you know what, you're actually right. That's a good point. Um, we're happy to just do that. You've opened up Pandora's box there, of course, where it's like, well, now they think now there's solidarity among them. They're getting ideas, and uh, we don't want that. We want them nice and crushed, and uh, that is true for these organized beggars on the street. In my view, as well, it's part of a program whereby you keep people in the most visceral in your face sense completely subjugated on a street level um because otherwise why would it be happening why would it, why would it not be just be it i'll get to my dad's interest actually Okay, guys, uh, stream went down there for a sec on my end. I don't know what happened with uh, you. Sorry about that. Just look at, let me know in the chat there because it's getting late anyway. I might wrap it up soon enough. But um, can you guys let me know if I'm um, if I'm going or what? Because I just don't know the whole thing. Just I think it did the I was refreshing tweets and it it kind of um messed it up a little bit. I was sharing my screen. And that's kind of gone, but I actually think I, we can probably live without that. Although I could just put it back up. Could just put it back up while I'm at it. So, yeah. So this guy just just makes I I go on and on. I know, but uh, the yeah. He goes on to say, specifically, quasi-criminal migrants are used to free up communal shared space real estate so developers or whomever can move in without opposition. It also forces people to move to areas where they have to pay to escape diversity. In the U.S., this phenomenon is more visible. This is the interesting but definitely true for the, the kind of almost like little sort of brewing uh, social unrest that's happening in Dublin's inner city, north inner city. Um, he says, finally, it also give, it gives globalists an in they didn't have before previous criminal elements would have been indigenous now they are migrants dependent on welfare and without local support once they have served whatever purpose they can be moved on so like you know um it, like if you want like obviously they want dublin inner city for to just completely redevelop it i think that's kind of clear enough 
And uh, the problem is this like multi-generational working class inner city communities. They don't want to go anywhere. They're Irish. They have their connections to each other. And if you could just break that down and sort of drive them out to the suburbs in various ways, replace it with kind of, a, and in order to do that, kind of impose this kind of um, proletarian migrant class in on top of them, uh, you can drive them out effectively. And that like what they call white flight, um, and uh, then this new class of people, because you, you could say, well, what's the point of driving one working class out and putting this proletarian migrant class in? Then you just have another squatting community. How are you meant to put in your swanky, redeveloped, expensive sort of inner city in once there? Because the migrants would be more easily moved on. They were transitory coming in. They could be transitory. Put, they can be pushed out into the suburbs after them in time when need be. The, the real nut to crack is the indigenous, rooted, local, multi-generational community. They're the ones who need to be cracked out and you use the i think it is a case that these migrant um, and minority communities are sort of pushed in there to become effect uh, ultimately a come close to a majority make the indigenous slowly into a smaller major minority and eventually they'll just want to leave as often happens but um he's speaking to that and this is the same for look these professional organized beggars being sort of shoved in they might not be shoved in like literally although often they are but it's a sort of a tactic often used by um, various real estate people in New York and London, famously, certain types of people. But um, so that's that that speaks to the existence of these, like why this happens as well. So anyway, final thing I want to talk about or not talk about, it's the same subject uh, that I want to show you is this article. This is a little known story from all the way back in 2010, maybe even before that in Cork. It speaks to what I'm talking about. So the there's a place called and square they sell like um knickknacks and wool and all this kind of stuff lovely there's two of them lovely hmm. so yeah um the these are nice sort of really some of the nice shops and lovely places Okay, sorry guys, gone again. Um, you know, I got fiber broadband and uh, I moved house and everything. Someone says kill my tabs. Okay, it's a good idea. That makes sense. Okay, so I'm on a Chromebook as well, really, and I think that's going to weak, probably. But um, okay, tabs are killed. So effectively... Yeah, sorry about that. So the, the 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 kind of plot thickens with this a little bit, and I do want to share it just so you know, so you can see. Da -da -da -da. You should probably even make this out anyway on the screen share. Sorry about this, I don't know. It's just bad Wi-Fi or bad connection for some reason. So so I'll read some of it. So Joan Lucy, the owner of independent Cork-based bookstore chain, or they sell books as well, denied she was being racist. This is 2010. Denied she was being racist and said she felt she had no other option. Um, quote, we are being made out as the villains here when in actual fact we are the victims. The bottom line is I need to protect my staff and stock, unquote, she said. So 
I'm I'm giving you this story from 2010 to speak to my overall, let's say, theory that like the state actually is sort of facilitating and sanctioning this, not just maybe failing to take action. They are it's it's actively sanctioned and uh, protected by the state. That's my theory. So bear that in mind as I'm reading this to you. The Cork Business Association, so the local sort of Chamber of Commerce, whatever, said it fully supported to support and protect one of her members. Now, bear in mind, this is just a woman who's being robbed. She didn't name the type of people. She didn't do anything like that. She just put those people who were like, there's, I don't think anyone disputes they were robbing her. It's probably evidenced by camera footage and that. She just said, these are the people that are robbing me. I didn't, I'm not making these people be the people that are robbing me. They just, that's just what's happening. Um, and yet she, uh, she starts being accused of being racist, right? And you might ask, well, I mean, who accused her of being racist? Like to some random person or what? I mean, who cares? Like anyone can accuse anyone of anything or you're a bad person or you're a good or bad. No, it was, um, well, we'll get to it. So article goes on, blah, blah, blah. I'll get to the good bit. <laughs> it says, Miss, so the even the examiner trying to um, exculpate her here a little bit. Miss Lucy, who is, because this is probably like the most, like, this person is like a conformist in a sense. Like she's a business owner. She wants to keep a clean reputation. She she doesn't have some sort of, she's not like a political radical or anything like that. She's, you know, so there's, there's a racism accusation is like a, a big, huge deal in the world of the average business owner or polite member of society and all that, especially in 2010. Um, so this just came totally like a curveball into her life, you know. Um, she's just trying to run her business. So they say, uh, Miss Lucy, who in 2004 sponsored an ethnic soccer team in Cork. So she's, you know, playing, she's she's doing her bit, right, apparently on the whole uh, social agenda. Said her staff members have also retrieved stock which wasn't paid for from some of the women who tried to leave the shop up the skirt, right, up the dress, the, the you know, the produce from the shop. Um, she said the women would also shout and roar abuse at her staff, right, who began to feel intimidated and at risk. After a recent shoplifting incident, she said she took a photograph of the gang outside her store and posted it on the window underneath the word beware. That's it. Um, I felt if the photograph was on the window, it would deter them. Now, here's the good bit. It has worked. It has worked. But Miss Lucy said she has had complaints from NASC. Now, NASC is um, what's the acronym? I've, I've been looking at them for years, but I actually don't know what NASC stands for. National something or other, probably. Um, doesn't really matter. It's an NGO, right? Um, now they are funded by, I haven't checked in a while. It doesn't really matter. Benefax isn't there anymore. That's another story. But effectively, uh, a mix of state funded, heavily state funded, and then like the Roundtree Foundation and the Open Society Foundation and the, the Chuck Feeney and the Atlantic Philanthropies, all, you know, like uh, uh, speaking to my theory, billionaires and the state, effectively, because philanthropies are just billionaires funded effectively by billionaires and by the state without ever being voted on any of that NGO. Um, so effectively this regime entity, literally billionaire state, um, she said she has had complaints from NASC, the Irish Immigrant Support Group, and from members of the Cork Anti-Racism Network, C-A-R-N. So these groups just come out of nowhere, right? Um, mind boggling every time I read this stuff. They just come out and they start sort of saying, oh, well, that's racist or whatever. Uh, bear in mind, she didn't actually technically or in any way make anything about race at all. She just said, I just want these people to not be robbing my shop. That's all. Um, she didn't say, why are they in the country? La, 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 la. She didn't do any of that. And yet just for saying, I don't want to be robbed by these people. Here they are. Can they please stop robbing me? This state funded organization and the Cork Anti-Racism Network, I'm sure is state funded too. They're all sort of this big web of like one funds the other. These state entities come in and say, you're racist. Now, bear in mind that carries with it a heavy toll in this society, especially if you're someone who's trying to play the game. I'm trying to run a business. I'm trying, I don't, I'm not saying anything about anyone. I just want a clean reputation, run my business and not get robbed and pay the wages and have a good time. And that's it. 
for someone like that being called racist, especially by this group that has the stamp of, well, this is a NASC, this is the CAORN group, this is the Cork Anti-Racism Society or whatever, you're getting called racist by them, that could be fatal, right? She had to claw her way back and the Commerce, Chamber of Commerce and even the examiner are sort of helping her a little bit. But the fact that the NASC, and it's effectively like a, a mafia racket, really, when you think about it this way, and again, state funded, that's the important bit. It's not just a bunch of headbangers. These are state paid people um, are putting blood in the water to say, well, you know, you know, um, we've said that. What did they say? They said. Um, she. Uh, yeah, she said that but they're basically calling a racist and they said that. Um, they said Miss Lucy's actions could incite hatred. So they're like, well, we're sort of calling you racist. What we're saying is you could incite racism with you, what you're doing here by saying these people are robbing your shop. And then she says, well, they are robbing my shop. I, I'm, I'm not making a thing of who they are, what they are. I'm just saying these people are robbing my shop. And then ask them and say, well, that could, what, that could incite bad feeling. Um, and thus we're sort of right on the brink of coming straight out and saying, oh, oh, ring the alarm bell. This woman is uh, this woman's a racist, guys. And and even like when they say the the like in a court case where they say the trial is the punishment, you know, being dragged through it all, even if she can maybe come out on the other side and sort of um, clean her reputation afterwards, it's that's a bad thing out there for her. Um, and of course, the process then of her, her getting back in the good books, they probably get her to attend workshops and this, that and the other and maybe even contribute herself and bend the knee and all of this. So um, you can see how that speaks to my point, doesn't it? Like if, if someone said, look, your theory on the fact that the state effectively makes it so that you have to look at this egregious corruption that's going on in your face and you not only you have to you have to suck it up. You have to look down and accept it. This is an imposed sort of like a mafia or something that is in your face and it has state sanctioning and state backing. It's not just that the state is failing to act on it. It's that which would be one thing, and that's enough for the state to just fail to act on crime effectively. But for the state to actually come in and say, oh, not just that, but when you act on it, even in a perfectly respectable, fair, reason, neutral way, just about the crimes themselves, when you act on it, we'll say you can't. No, these people are actually protected. Um, these people are protected and you can't say anything about it. You can't even put their picture up on the window when they're robbing you blind. Um, and and this is these are state-funded organizations and they come out with these words like racist. This just, you have to zoom out and know that that word just means the state is putting a hit out on you effectively, on your business, on your personal life. And they have inserted the magic power into this. It's not that people are afraid of the word. It's that people know that that word is like a, like a, like a marking tag on an animal or a laser pointer on an animal. It's not about what people think of the word. It's that, that, or, or the morality of how you, your views, it's that people know that if you're that, then that's bad. And you are blacklisted effectively from, by the regime from society. Um, so that's an example of that. It's a, and I'm sure there are many more examples you could find of this, but this is just like open and shut towards my theory that this whole thing of, um, these um and even i have to use um pseudonyms or whatever for this organized beggars um so uh, you know i'm acting it out myself that uh you know th they are completely protected like so when you're seeing these people getting into new bmws with their stuff and looking at you with contempt and looking through you unless they have the sad face on for a moment and and uh caring note for for you know, if you're if you're one of these people who's renting a two thousand euro shit box of a house, and um, you have three kids, and you're worried about even being evicted from that because you don't know even with your two thousand euro will it get you another shit box? Will you just be homeless? And when you are, no one's going to care. Um, the, and these people don't care about that. They absolutely don't. Um, you have to just walk past that and suck it up because it states actually it's intentional. Um. Because why else, just why else would it be happening? You're not going to see that in, you know, China. I keep going on about China, but they have, like, they probably have some homeless people and all that. But again, they have enough of a sort of a, a relationship between the ruled and the rulers that um, if people didn't kind of want that, it would be allowed, you know, or it would be nipped in the bud and dealt with. Um, 
Yeah, I just thought that Nask story was really interesting. It's 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 shocking. It's actually one of the most, I would say, in a, in a strong field. It's one of the most interesting case studies in all of the last thirty years of Irish history. I would say, is this this actual article because while it's a minor silly issue really compared to some big big things like i mean obviously uh, not to put the two in any kind of same category there's like ashling murphy and puska there was the dublin riots there's been all these big things have happened but in this and 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 uh, terrible things and um and major flashpoints in in the sort of culture and the debate in, in Irish society about immigration and that but this is a small little story but it's it's this is where sort of front lines are happening as well, that all the way back in 2010, you have someone who is completely unimpeachable and just doesn't want to be robbed is told by the state effectively, no, you have to, you're the bad guy actually here. That's what you are. You're being robbed and you're the bad guy. And these people are victims of you, which is basically what they're saying. It's absolutely bizarre and surreal, but, um, here we are. I wonder if they said any more, and I'll just leave it there. So the city traders rallied to her defense. Oh, she's not being racist. So everyone has to come and go, no, 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 she's not racist. And she has to say, no, no, I'm not racist. Like, um, just for getting robbed. Anyway, look, uh, I might leave it there. I, although I think I have some super chats there, which is very kind. Um, if I can, I just need to open up a YouTube tab because I closed everything. Um, da, da, da. Sorry, this internet issue tonight is pretty bad. Um, I don't know why it's been good at, thus far. I'm waiting for the chat to open. Okay, so so armchair Limerick nationalist uh, throws five euro. Thank you very much, and said you should you should run for election in Cork. Why not? I've, I've, I've said my piece on that before. I don't think I'm the best person, or not the best, I don't think I'm at all suited to running in politics like that. Um, at least not now. Like people, I've, I've, I've said this before, but people like Derek Bly and Philip Dwyer and Stephen Kerr and all these others, they're very like active, very, they're, they're well into these kind of confrontation things. Their work ethic, their ability to always be going is massive. And uh, they have a certain energy and a certain temperament and talent for that kind of high energy, high activity stuff. Whereas, uh, you know, um, I just don't think that I, I like to sit around and think about all this stuff and talk away. And so I think I'm best placed doing what I'm doing and um, writing the odd article, doing the odd live stream, covering this stuff, following it closely. I have all kind of these contacts in that um, the sort of in the media activism pundit kind of space. Um, I care very deeply about all of this, like the the Ireland, effectively. So it's not for want of that. Um, it's just I think I'm best placed. I can support electoral candidates. I can I can pay attention to what's going on, and you know I'm fighting my own little battle in my own way. And it's just not running for a seat somewhere. I think some uh, there there are plenty of other people who could do that very well. Um. It's not that everybody has to run, you know, but a lot of people should, just maybe not me. Um, so Sheepdog, five euro as well, says, and thank you, says, no need to say, enjoy a coffee. Oh, no need to say it. I, well, I will anyway. Enjoy a coffee. I might bump into you in Cork and looking forward to to some day. Okay, cool. Yeah, we might bump into each other sometime. You'll know me. I won't know you, I suppose. Um, Finolo Maracu five quid as well and leaves it i can't see the emoji a bunny a rabbit okay thank you very much um so yeah uh, i appreciate that guys and uh this is a late one and the internet went so look try to do better with it next time go a bit earlier and figure out what, i suppose it's just too many tabs um yeah so look that's the crack with that i will go live again soon there's loads i want to be talking about but um yeah, it's it's a tired issue. This in a way, like everybody knows this kind of uh, what's going on with these organized beggars or, or whatever. I'm not one to just kind of go on and point at the obvious and like the kind of cheap, like oh look at this outrage content. Or I I don't necessarily want to do that. I always want to try to offer a view on it or whatever instead of just like you know, Mac and sometimes it maxes out your numbers. You can do get better views and all this kind of stuff by just doing outrage bait all the whole time. 
But um, the point for me is to talk about the staid involvement, not just the the grime on the street. It's um, it's that when you next see this, I'd like you to. I I I'm trying to. It's sort of argue for you to not just see it and be annoyed by what's in front of you like oh these people are total piss takers and it's so wrong or whatever but just to see them as sort of walking avatars of the guys in the golf courses the shadow banks the banties all these people because might be like i've argued they are there for that reason i think the nask article and everything kind of sort of backs that up it's not just a theory like that is open and shut sort of evidence of it really um that they are there as a avatar of the a low level, ground level, egregious example and or, or sort of um shadow version of the corruption at the top. To, a sort of like a front line, just to get everyone into complete submissiveness on a daily basis so that you don't ever think that you have any stake in society or any uh, uh, ability to voice your your uh, displeasure at something happening in the most awful, obvious, corrupt way on the street in front of you um so my view would be to see it not as oh this individual is 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 being bad in front of me it's that this is the living embodiment of the regime that rules over you um that's what it is in my view anyway so look uh i will leave it there guys and i'll be back again soon for more rambles um if not uh this weekend then Maybe though I'll be on tomorrow, but uh, if not, have a good um, bank holiday weekend.